Aloha, everyone. I'm Becky, the executive director here at the Hawaii International Film Festival, and I am so excited um, to be presenting this panel tonight as part of, of the HIF Spring Showcase Series JFest lineup. Um, we have a really stellar panel, and I'm so excited for this talk story. I think it's going to be um, one of the best we've done this year. Um, as a reminder, JFest runs through the end of this weekend, so be sure to check out all the films um, as part of this series. We have some really, really incredible films um, from Japan, the, the best cinema out of Japan right now we're showcasing on our watch.hip.org site. And then um, be sure to check out the rest of the showcase series coming up in June and July. We're doing a foodie fest next and then a French film showcase in July. Um, but tonight we get to have um, these stellar speakers with us and artists discussing um, all these themes in our current JFest program around music. So to kick things off, first, I'm sorry, first I have to thank, especially thank um, the First Insurance Company of Hawaii for presenting the JFest series with HIF and also especially thank Josh um, as a community co-presenter of this series as well. So we're so honored for the support from FICO and Josh. Um, now I get to introduce to you all Reina Kaneko. Um, since 2016, Reina has served as the president of the Japan America Society of Hawaii. Um, prior to which she served more than a decade with the Girl Scouts of Hawaii. And since that time, she has served as a leader in the Japan America Society of Hawaii organization and um, cultivating strong relationships um, between J Japanese culture and the people of Hawaii. So we're so grateful. Josh also states that they serve the people of Hawaii by offering educational programs for students from K to 12th grade, as well as special interest programs for members and the general public. So be sure to check out all of Josh's programs and resources as well after the panel. So Reina, take it away. Thank you, Becky. Um, so the Japan America Society of Hawaii, or JASH as we're known, is really proud to be a HIF J Fest Festival partner. And we're, we're thrilled today to be a co-host in the discussion that you'll be seeing with the talented musicians who you'll meet who are perpetuating the music of traditional Japanese instruments. We will see how they honor the tradition of their instruments while bringing forth their personal style, uh, interpretation, and influences. So thank you everyone for joining us today and special thanks to our moderator and panelists who you'll meet in a minute. Um, I'd like to turn it over now to HIF's Director of Programming, Anna Page. Hello, everyone, and thank you so much, Becky and Reina, for those wonderful introductions. Uh, we're very excited to present this panel today as part of our JFest program and tandem with two films that we have at the festival, this JFest, that are both music focused. The primary jumping off point of this panel today is a film called Ito, which if you haven't seen it already, um, is a fictional drama set in a rural region outside of Aomori in northern Japan and centers around a coming of age story around a young woman who really is learning to um, find herself and her roots through her playing of the Tsugaru Shamisen. Uh, also, in addition to the film Ito, we have another music-focused documentary during JFest called Jazz Kisa Basie, which focuses on a jazz cafe in rural Iwate, Japan, um, and its enigmatic owner. It's, it's really a love letter to the culture of jazz cafes and the history of jazz cafes in Japan and uh, the audiophiles that live in them. Uh, so, uh, I, without further ado, you know, I'm really excited that we have both these films and this opportunity to present this really unique collaborative panel discussion with Jash today. So, I'm going to uh, take a moment to introduce our panelists and our moderator and then let them take it away from there. So uh, on the panel today, we have Darren Miyashiro, who is born and raised in Hawaii and studied at the Sawai Koto Institute in Tokyo, and he teaches Koto in Honolulu and Hilo. 
we also have Chris Molina. Chris is a composer performer specializing in Japanese shakuhachi and East Asian instruments and is a recipient of fellowships from the Japan Foundation and the East West Center and a frequent visitor to Japan. Uh, also on today's panel, we have Andrew Madoka. Uh, Andrew is born and raised in Osaka, Japan, and has been performing Japanese folk songs since she was two and a half years old. Andrew has been training under the guidance of her mother, Ma Madoka Shoju, the current head of the Madoka no Kai Japanese Folk Song School. And just to clarify, Andrew herself is actually a shamisen player. And last but not least on our panel, we have William Watson, who is a composer with special interest in East Asian instruments, film scoring, and video game music. And uh, to moderate our discussion today, we have Koto musician herself, uh, ethnomusicologist, and host of the Hawaii Public Radio's The Brazilian Experience, Sandy Tsukiyama, who will be moderating our discussion today. So I just want to thank all of you for being here this evening. And without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Sandy. Thank you very much, Anna, Raina, and Becky, and Anderson, of course. So uh, we have we have a pretty interesting cross section of people who are interested in and involved in playing different kinds of uh, Japanese music. And so, um, first of all, uh, I guess I would like to get each one of us to introduce ourselves and talk about how you got into playing your instrument and, you know, your journey with it. Because we're here in Hawaii, we're not in Japan, we're in the United States. Uh, many of us, I think, with the exception of Anju, uh, we are like, not from Japan, but we have our roots there or, you know, we were somehow attracted to it. So I would, um, I guess I would like to call on, uh, <laughs> uh, let me pick on Chris first. <laughs> How did you come to play your instrument and what's your journey with it so far? Oh, thanks, Sandy. Yeah. Um, a number of people in the States have Japanese roots and that's how they make their way to finding an instrument like shakuhachi. But of course, I don't have any roots in Japan. I was mostly interested in the sound that the instrument makes. I remember I was in the music library at the University of Michigan scouting through CDs and I found a CD of all new music for shakuhachi and I was so turned on, I was so excited and I had taken a freshman year's worth of Japanese language at college and then given it up because it didn't have anything to do with my major. But uh, Shakuhachi became the reason I went to Japan for four years and continue to study the language. And it ended up sort of deciding the, the route that my life is taking. So that was a really big deal. And I need to pay it some credit there. Thank you, Chris. Okay, we'll uh, delve into a lot of what, what you may be doing nowadays a little later. So, um, William, you're next. Hi, Tell Sandy. us about yourself. You. Yeah, um, much much like Chris, I don't have any, any Japanese roots back on the States. Um, mm -hmm. I was introduced to um, Japanese music, uh, gagaku, sankyoku, um, through the university at App State in North Carolina. Um, and yeah, I was really attracted to that. And, and that's one of the main reasons I came out here is to study, to study East, East Asian music. And I guess as a composer, you know, I think most composers usually try to play the instruments that they're going to write for, or at least have a good fundamental understanding of them. And of all the instruments that I tried, I was in uh, Gagaku and uh, eventually um, Darren's uh, Japanese ensemble. So I went through Gyuteki, uh, Hichiriki, um, Shinobue, playing different things, but Shakohachi was the one that really um, 
I guess resonated with me. Um, and so uh, I started I started playing that um, as more of I think not not so much performance, but really just meditative kind of just personal just felt good to recalibrate playing playing the instrument. So that's how I got started with with that. Thank you, Will, and we'll get we'll be talking more with you in a bit. So uh, I guess the next one I'm going to pick on will be Darren. So you're from Hawaii, right? Yeah, uh, born on Oahu, raised in Hilo. Um, you know, I was desperate to get off the rock as soon as high school was done. Um, got over to the University of Redlands, um, majored in music, much to my dad's dismay. Um, I kind of, yeah, I kind of cheated. I told him, oh, I needed to do that to get free guitar lessons. I had to declare a music major and, and he bought it. So um, anyhow, <laughs> um, I, I, hope, I, hope, I hope I told him about that before, but uh, he might be hearing it for the first time. But anyway, so yeah, so I was at the University of Redlands studying music, um, but I've always been interested in Japan. Growing up here, you know, we, got, we grew up watching Kikaida and all those Japanese superhero shows. Um, uh, my parents do not speak Japanese and they, they didn't push the culture or anything like that. So um, I got accepted to a one-year Waseda program uh, during my junior year. And the music chair, uh, Phil Swanson, he sat me down and he said, hey, so you're going to be in Japan for a year. He said, yeah. He goes, what are you going to do about your music credits? And I said, I don't know, because nothing would transfer. So he said, why don't you learn an instrument, do an independent study? I was like, okay. Like what? And he said, well, go to the library and, uh, you know, find something. So um, like Chris, I guess I went to the Redlands library and uh, they had Shakuachi, Shamisen and Koto. These are LPs, not CDs yet. <laughs> and uh, yeah, the Koto just, uh, I like I like the string bending is very bluesy sounding. And um, yeah, I like the music, you know, very sparse and uh, just had a really nice sound to it. Um, so when I got to Waseda, um, I, uh, Richard Emmert um, in, was a professor of one of the classes, and he teaches no theater in Japan still. And he introduced me to Kaze Sawai. And life changed from there. Kaze Sensei, great sensei, uh, very uh, encouraging, I guess would be the word, um, full of energy. And uh, yeah, so it was uh, supposed to be just a three-month independent study thing. but. Um, yeah, did it, did it for a year, had to finish up school, had no job. Um, I didn't get a scholarship like Chris, uh, so I'm kind of envious. <laughs> I, did, I did apply for the Momo show, didn't get it. Um, but Kazu Sensei said, hey, um, you can come here. Like there's a couple other Americans that are um, tutoring English while they're studying Koto and you can make, you know, pay your rent that way. So that's what I did and uh, spent four years there going through the ranks, you know, beginner, intermediate, advanced, eventually getting my instructor um, certification, taking the test. And uh, that's where I got introduced to Shamisen actually um, for that. And when I was done with the test, I said, I'm gonna study something I want. That's how I got into Gagaku and did that for a few months and then finally just moved back to Hawaii. And yeah, ended up back here. And I thought I had escaped the Koto, but um, as you know, there's the Sawai Kotokai here and carries the name of my school. Uh, Makiko Goto is the, the found, founder, a co-founder along with Dr. Bernice Hirai, um, followed by Shoko. And these are both my senpais, my seniors. And um, yeah, and then Kazuya Sensei said, hey, Shoko is moving to the mainland, Darren, you gotta take over. <laughs> so um, yeah, and that's how I kind of ended up with things. And yeah, all these twists and turns, um, did end up going back to Hilo to teach this small group there, the Soshinkai, um, which was an Okinawan Koto group, but they do some Japanese stuff as well. But the, um, the late uh, Shizuko Akamine asked me to take over the group. So um, yeah, so I kind of dabble in all these different things. Three months, three month independent study turned into about three decades of stuff. Anyhow. Thank you, Darren. And we'll get back to you later too. So now, Anjusan, um, 
please tell us about your involvement with shamisen and the type of music that you grew up with with the shamisen. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, this is my family club, and my parents and um, grandparents doing the folk song, Japanese traditional folk songs. So um, I'm singing since I can remember. And shamisen and folk song came into my life really naturally. And when I went to Australia for the walking holiday, I wrote my shamisen and I did um, street performance at that time. Then I started thinking about performing for abroad. Right. So uh, what brought you to Hawaii to, for the time that you were here? Uh, my grandma loved, really loved Hawaii and she passed away. But after I got my name, Andrew Madoka, uh, me and mom visited Hawaii since my grandma passed away, so really long time. At that time, we pick up one, I forgot which magazine, but there, it said Bond Dance Festival. And then we we have been doing Bond Dance Festival music in Japan over, I don't know, my mom doing over 35 years, something. So we found it and then we thought, oh, maybe, if there is a chance, we want to grab the chance to perform in Hawaii for the bond dance at the beginning. And then we contacted Hompa Honganji, and next year we came back to performing for Hawaii in Hawaii. And so you uh, came just to perform, but then I understand that you lived here for over a year. Mm -hmm. And what was that like? The was what was it like i enjoyed it because i met really many people like lena sanders josh and yuja sh or many people i've met in hawaii that in some and then i've been performing together with him um that was really honored to be there in hawaii and i really enjoyed it i learned a lot well, I sure hope you'll be able to come back because there are many people who want to learn shamisen. So <laughs> there's work for you here. <laughs> um, I guess if if I may uh, toot my own horn at this moment. So I mean, why I was asked to to be part of this this panel discussion with these illustrious people here. Uh, I am a third generation uh, Japanese, grown, born and raised here in Honolulu. I live in the same house I grew up in, and uh, all of my grandparents are from all four different parts of Japan. And um, we didn't grow up speaking Japanese. I was sent to Japanese language school as a little kid, but um, stopped after about three years. And uh, playing in the yard, there was a lady who lived on the one street over. And she played the koto, and I believe her husband played the shakuhachi. And so playing in the yard, I would hear that sound coming over across the stream. And it, it always really touched me, and I thought it was so beautiful. And uh, I always remember the sound of it. And then when I was uh, 16 years old in high school, um, one of my best friends was... Uh, Nancy Mackay and her father was uh, Dr. Neil Mackay. So we went to, I spent a lot of time at the, the music department and there were always different kinds of concerts and recitals going on. And so in the afternoon, we'd go back at night and listen and so many different types of music. And I had learned piano. I had studied piano for, I guess, cumulatively about 10 years and fooled around a little bit on the guitar and ukulele. But I saw uh, a gentleman who is now my, my dear friend, uh, Bill Feltz, and he was playing the koto in a, in a, I believe it was a concert of stringed instruments. And so it was the first time I actually saw a koto played live in front of me, and I was just enthralled. And I said, I've, I've, got, to, I've got to learn that. And so incidentally, my father was going to Japan 
the following month for business. And he says, well, what would you like me to bring you back from Japan? I said, I'd like a koto. <laughs> he said, koto. So uh, yeah, he went, uh, jumped through a lot of hoops and brought me back a koto. And we have uh, a sensei, a well-known sensei here in Honolulu. Her name was Kei Mikami. And she was a student of uh, Miyagi Michio, who many consider to be the master who brought the koto into the 20th century. And so she was one of his first students. And so I, I played with her for many years. And then, uh, to, and during the time that I was working on my ethnomusicology undergrad degree in the days that they had that program at UH Music Department, uh, that was part of my credits. And so then uh, I went off to Brazil to pursue my interest in West African influenced music of the, the Western hemisphere. But um, when I came back, I studied a little bit with Maki Kogoto, who had just, uh, she arrived here a couple of years after I got back in the early 80s. And uh, since then, uh, I kind of fell out of practice. But uh, I think the, all, of the, all of the signs are pointing in the direction that I need to get back into studying and that I was gifted with a Juta Shamisen and Darren just gave me a good little intro into how to hold it and how to tune it, things like that. So uh, who knows, those uh, are my current goals, musical goals right now to get back into playing koto and um, uh, learning shamisen. So that's uh, where I guess I qualify to be on this panel here. So for each of us here, I mean, um, have all of us seen both of the films, Ito and Jazz Kisabesi? Everyone has? Okay. Um, so what do we have? Uh, what are the things that really touched us in the Ito film and or the, the Jazz Kisabesi? Anybody want to volunteer? Otherwise, I'm going to pick on you as the good retired teacher that I am. Sure, I'll volunteer. Um, so I enjoyed both of the films and I think there's a great connection that uh, our programmers have set us up with, which, you know, two films featuring two small cafes in the North and one is real and one is fictional, but they both serve as a, a place for a very specific community to come together and community is an important topic for Hawaii. Um, so I just really enjoyed the fact that we have these two cafes and one is for jazz aficionados and the other is for otaku, I guess, maybe to put it generously. Um, but with uh, the jazz cafe Basie, uh, there was a gentleman describing to the group towards the end of that a documentary where he explains that um, jazz is just the pretext and the cafe is really uh, ultimately about people. And I enjoyed that. That's really my feeling. I'm sure our feeling about music in general. And uh, gosh, there's nothing more exciting than a team of musicians working together to sculpt sound, to inject emotion and finally uh, perform a piece of music uh, where both the process and the result are a thing of beauty and that's what makes music so worthwhile so it was very nice that they they captured that and uh, i think the topic of community in ito ito michi is also really worth discussing but i'll stop talking now i'd love to hear other people's comments <laughs> Okay, anybody else have thoughts on on the two films? Comparing them? Darren? Okay, yeah. Um, so yeah, just uh, general, uh, I don't want to get too much of the music part yet because I could totally start geeking out on that. But um, yeah, I uh, really enjoyed uh, both films. And uh, I generally lean towards documentaries, but um, I did 
really enjoyed Ito and um, actually uh, what I liked about it was uh, the, the mountain seemed to play a, like it was like an important symbol or something. And uh, yeah, kind of reminded me about like Mauna Kea, you know, you get home in Hilo as, as literally as you're leaving the airport, assuming it's a clear day and you can see it, it's right there. And yeah, it's, you know, it's sort of this uh, central uh, symbol or whatever. But, uh, but anyway, yeah, and, um, but as the, uh, um, the director had pointed out, um, and yeah, I, I kind of figured out pretty soon that it wasn't so much about Shamisen as it was about this girl and her you know, coming of age and um, kind of breaking out of her shell and how the director said that she wanted, um, uh, I guess the viewers to be aware of uh, human relations, um, you know, um, and especially for uh, introverted people. And even the cafe owner was trying to explain to her about, um, you know, building these individual connections uh, as opposed to, you know, just creating public spaces for group socializing that um, there are people that need more of these, um, uh, I guess, smaller, less, less intimidating um, places to socialize. So, um, so that kind of, you know, gave me a different perspective on these maid cafes, especially. Um, and, uh, you know, the fact that she was encouraged to play, um, by her, um, her friend and, uh, not just her grandmother, you know, um, so kind of, you know, helping her realize that, Hey, yeah, I'm doing something special. Um, and, uh, probably the quote that, uh, got me the most in the movie, which I kind of want to, you know, I hope that everybody feels this way is like, she said, I always, I want to always work with people I like. Um, that being the reason why she wouldn't quit the cafe and um, and yeah it's impossible to like everybody that you work with but if you can find those people um, you know it's really important especially for those that feel uh, socially awkward so you know this um, and then from there you build these connections family friends colleagues um, uh, the inter uh, interconnectedness with everything um, and in uh, Kisa Basie uh, Elvin Jones uh, he mentioned, he mentioned something about, he was talking about how the Japanese festival rhythms were similar to some rhythms that he, he was familiar with. And he started talking about just, you know, these fundamental um, things with humanity that, you know, we all share regardless of where we live. Um, and then uh, they showed a quote from uh, Count Basie himself, where he said, uh, uh, the most important thing for a band, uh, it's not learning music, it's learning people. So, yeah, I agree. Thanks, Darren. Will, what were the connections that you made? I'm definitely connected with, as, as Chris and Darren have said, the, the, the whole community and that, that process of sharing the music, you know, uh, when, when you perform and when you're in this particular space, everything is, you know, resonating with everyone, everyone is experiencing the thing and to be able to share that, I think is really, um, that, that's, that's really it. Um, it's sort of hard to put into words better than what they've said and what Count Basie says, but yeah, learning to people and just, just having, having that experience or that, having that conversation, well, without having a conversation, um, is that's super special and i think that's a lot of a lot of what music making and is, is about so um yeah that's that's what that's how i connected to that thanks will sure Anjusa, how did you uh, what were the two what well, the things about the both films that spoke to you most of all um, when she started playing shamisen again and practice with her grandmother and the way grandma look at her uh, lovely looking and look proudly and i know that i i know that i is exactly my grandma looked at me that way so i really touched and i remember oh my grandma look at me like that and now 
I can feel how she felt that time. And I was really touched. And from just kiss the baby, the Mr. Sugawara-san, who the owner, is a just kiss the baby. He said, uh, the music never get old. And the folk songs and these instruments have history. But I feel if the listener hears it for the first time, and it's an encounter with new music. So as a performer and a teacher, I like to share with people to get more interested in Japanese tradition. And I want to give them fresh feeling with Japanese tradition. So I don't know how it, but I will think about. Thank you. I really appreciate that you could personally identify with Ito as a young girl and growing up with that tradition and knowing the same grandmother's approval look, that that really touches me. And um, I just watched the, the Jazz Kisa Basi today, so it's quite fresh in my mind. And for myself, having grown up in a, in a, in a jazz environment, and uh, experiencing jazz in another country as well. It, uh, looking at that film and seeing how people go to the coffee shop and not drink alcohol so they won't get loud and listen to it in silence and not even be able to read or rustle newspaper. It was, um, if you tell that to like American jazz people, especially people who, who you know, grew up in that element, the, the African-American uh, setting, that it's customary to yell encouragement to the performers, like in Kabuki theater, when the actors come out, you all yell encouragement to them. So that's what you do for jazz musicians. And that I remember in, uh, in Brazil, and uh, there was a big jazz, uh, big jazz festival, and they brought in a lot of American, American artists. And uh, somebody was playing really, really great. I think it was McCoy Tyner or somebody. And somebody in the audience yelled, uh, he was so happy, and the entire audience just went shh. <laughs> and so uh, it made me think that uh, I guess that in this setting, in another country, jazz is seen as something that is patronized by the uh, upper crust of, of society. It's not, uh, I mean, Brazil has its own Afro-Brazilian uh, tradition of samba, which is very raucous and very you know, joyous. And, and you, know, you can yell and scream and sing as loud as you want, but jazz takes on a different, a different, uh, it's regarded in a different way. And so I found that interesting. Yet, yeah, so with that jazz cafe in Japan and comparing that to the, the maid cafe in Aomori, that that was more like a, um, a down home kind of coffee shop where people could come and um, eat the apple pies made with apples right down the road and people could come in and hear the music that they you know hold near and dear in the folk tradition and i was happy to see that that they got um creative in keeping that cafe alive so those were uh, the things that that <laughs> it made me want to eat apples <laughs> So let's see now. Um, okay, since I know that uh, we are dealing with traditional instruments of Japan, the shakuhachi, which is something my grandfather played as a young man. And so that when I actually started to play koto, he and my grandmother were, were very, very happy. So I also know that approving approving look of the grandparents because otherwise I was so Americanized. I didn't speak Japanese. I rode a bicycle. I wore my hair in braids like um, 
like the African American girls did. And so I was just very un Japanese. But so my playing koto was my my way in that I got approval from my family as for being Japanese from the culture. So um and I did uh, get to play with John Kaiser Neptune and Riley Lee. And so they've done they've done things bringing the shakuhachi into modern times as well. So um, like Chris, I know that you have uh, done some composing and how how have you been able to adapt or use these traditional Japanese instruments in the evolution in your work, bringing it into the 21st century? Boy, I love the weightiness of that question, Sandy. Absolutely. Bringing it into the new century. Yeah, I'm a big fan of those guys that you played with. And uh, I think the thing that turns me on about instruments like shakuhachi is something that Darren mentioned, which is uh, the bendiness of notes. I just love bending pitch and piano blocks that so entirely. So uh, being able to use vocal imitations, uh, really speaking with your instrument is so satisfying. And, you know, one of the things, you know, well, we do at UH is combining, you know, not just new music with Japanese instruments or one particular countries, but going across borders in different directions. And that's been very satisfying. And I feel like I'm only getting started on trying out shakuhachi with Korean instruments and Chinese instruments and maybe someday Indian instruments. But that's one of the coolest things about shakuhachi too, is that around the world now, there, there are people who are doing uh, like Irish jigs with shakuhachi and French folk song and Mongolian folk song with shakuhachi. And there's a guy doing Indian raga. And it's all over the map. I mean, I think many of us are using instruments now as a way to reach out and reach beyond our own culture. So that's one part of a very satisfying uh, community surrounding Shakuhachi. That's really great. I know John uh, Kaizan Neptune and I, we used to play surf music together and that was really fun. And um, of course, people are always asking, well, uh, how about how about amplifying and electrifying the koto? And, uh, you know, I've, I don't know, I guess maybe I'm just a little bit too purist. That, that, there's that side of me too. So, uh, but I really think that's great to be able to, um, what you call melt borders and not have to pigeonhole instruments into their own traditional settings. And like they say, music is the universal language. So I think taking all of these different instruments and having them play together, I mean, those are, those are steps to world peace. You know, play together in different ways, but creating new relationships and bringing happiness to people. So thank you for getting started in that endeavor. And you know, you're, you're just at the beginning of your journey. So go for it, man. <laughs> Will, yes. so you're doing pretty much the same thing with, with a bunch of different Asian instruments and you're getting the feel for them. And right. um, what are you doing? What am I doing? Well, first, I want to hear a, a surf rock version of like Kyojo Notsuki or Ko Kojo Notsuki. That would be really fun. Um, I, yes, it, much like Chris, I, um, there's all these cross cultural endeavors of, you know, not only playing, uh, in writing new music for traditional Japanese instruments, but merging those with, with the Western orchestra or Korean instruments or Chinese instruments, um, that sort of thing is, is super fascinating for me. But um, um, yeah, just, just, just doing that and, and trying to incorporate that in some of the more media music that I do, like um, writing you know, music for independent video games or, or film things, um, little, little animated shorts, incorporating that when, you know, when, when I can or when it's, uh, you know, uh, appropriate. Um, 
that is, yeah, all, all a part of that, the, the, the journey that, that I have embarked on. So, yeah, it's, um, it's I, I see it, um, is, especially in the video game world, like I see um, uh, Old Kame, um, Ghost of uh, Tsushima, uh, and even the, the Legend of Zelda. I don't know if anybody plays video games on the, on the panel, but like the, the latest uh, installation or Breath of the Wild or whatever, Kakariko Village has this wonderful um, Shakuhachi, Koto, and I think maybe Shinobue, or, or there's some other flutes involved with that, but just it's pretty inspiring to see triple A games incorporating these um, traditional instruments into um, into the now. So um, that that's exciting, and I want to be a part of that, um, you know, in my composition endeavors as well. Exactly. So I will echo my comments to Chris. Go for it, man. And so for uh, Anju. With Shamisen, nowadays it, it has seems to be enjoying new new popularity. It's I think maybe because uh, Mino and things like that have become fashionable that mm. uh, and then like what we saw in Ito that the she said she was going to play it with her own style, right? So um you see, you see that happening with your instrument in um, in Mino. I mean, folk folk traditions are always changing, mm -hmm. right? So, you see that happening with with shamisen, Mino. Yes, Mino. I see many performers singing folk songs with their own mood, own style. Some performer try to sing like a pop or rock, jazz. Try to sing their own style so it's interesting do you feel inspired to to take that uh to take that step and go with uh, your own style or has is that still to come <laughs> <laughs> oh well i don't know i'm just now following the traditional way to sing but when I tried to um, perform with Kenny Endo-san, at that time, I tried to sing new way, like my own style. Then my mom allowed me, allows me to do it. She is so open-minded. So she said, you can try anything you want. So yeah, I think I will try to do my own style too. Good. M mother's approval helps. <laughs> helps the inspiration <laughs> thank you now darren since you've been a student of kazuya sensei and she is about as modern and progressive as you can get that uh in carrying on her legacy as well as tadao sensei you know with his i mean it's uh and 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 so I school graduates have gone all over the world Right. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, uh, that all of these these traditional instruments are are going are getting around, and so so does that um, you know give you give you fire under your um, in in your hearth there? Um, or fire under my okole. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no. Um, yeah. Uh, seriously. Uh, yeah. Kazu Sensei. Um, a lot of that, the international spread of Koto is is thanks to her. Um, uh, Taro Sensei was, you know, he was just a master, so he was busy practicing, composing, um, and he passed away way too young. So, um, but he left us uh, a lot of uh, very, not just technically challenging, but I think there's a lot of musical value to his pieces. You know, so. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm trying to, that's, I'm going to spend the rest of my life practicing his stuff. Um, but uh, 
but also I want to keep Kazue Sensei's uh, spirit alive. Just her, yeah, um, yeah. She doesn't want to do things the same way all the time or the way it's supposed to be. Um, she can if she has to, but um, she also wants to express herself, and it's kind of harder to do in you know these, uh, for example, like with Koto and Sankyoku and Jiuta things like that, uh, versus like you mentioned with the folk folk traditions like with Anju and Sugata Jamisen, you know, there's a lot of improvisation and um, performers can sort of inject their own personality into it. Um, yeah, so uh, yeah. Um, and yeah, I'm just trying to, I guess the teaching part, you know, that's that's kind of what I feel the most responsibility for. Um, I don't compose, I kind of wish I could, so I'm envious of uh, Chris and Will, but uh, I have a bucket list of pieces that I, I should know as an instructor um, and that I want to know. I, I, I really like a lot of that stuff. We'll see if I ever, ever get to it. Um, but, but yeah, I get to do fun stuff with like Anju. So um, when we performed together, uh, we actually did a pop song that she uh, requested. Was it uh, Rise Up, uh, Andra Day or something? So um, yeah. yeah, she's got a beautiful voice. So I just have to, you know, make some pretty couple sounds behind it and back her up. So fun to do stuff like that. Okay, Anja needs to come back. Come back so we can, you know, create more things. And so what I appreciate about the Sawais in particular is that they'll take the, the students and give them the basics from the, like the Sokyoku and the classics. And then, so from once you know where you came from, then you can take off and do the modern stuff, which is great. I mean. My, my taste of it was with, with Miyagi's compositions and then with um, some of Tadao Sensei's pieces with, that I learned with Makiko. So I am very happy that I'm seeing uh, Japanese music and instruments going all over the world that um, in particular, right next door to me, uh, the lady that I grew up next to all my life, she passed away, but she used to play biwa. And so one day I saw Shamoto Sensei standing outside the house. And, and he says to me, he says, what are you doing here? And I said, I live here. What are you doing here? I said, I know why you're here. And I said, you came to get the biwa, right? And so sure enough, he got Mrs. Omon's biwa. There's a mosquito bothering me. He got Mrs. Omon's biwa and sent it to, it is now at the Gagaku in the University of Cologne in Germany. So I, um, unfortunately, all of her offspring are have passed away. But if I talk to anyone else in the family later, I'll be happy to tell them that the grandma's spirit is, is alive and well and making music in Germany <laughs> in, a, in a different incarnation. So, um, I think we have something in our chat here. So uh, let me take a look at it here. Okay, um, we're ready for Q and A. So fire away with the, with the questions. Q and A. Okay, I can click Hi. this on. Hi. Can everyone hear me? Yes, I Hi, can. This is Anderson. Hi, Hi, Sandy. Um, Hi. I have the I have the Q and A questions for you. I can read them all, if you'd like. Mm -hmm. um, so, so go uh, ahead. we have first one from Andrew on Facebook. Uh, I don't understand this question, but did Anju play along with someone on the Didgeridoo? Does that make any sense? Yeah. Did you do the yeah, it's the, the, uh, traditional Aboriginal thing. instrument, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. No, I haven't I haven't played with the Lizu Lidu, but I I bought the Lidu Lidu CD in Australia and I would like to yeah performing with someone who played Lidu Lidu in the future. Oh great. Okay. Uh, we have a question from Mari Yoshihara. It was interesting that both films take place in cafes. Because uh, um, we're going to Ito and uh, um, the jazz documentary. 
The two cafes are very different from each other, especially as gendered spaces. The maid cafe is obviously a space of highly gendered sexualized performance and consumption. Although at least this particular cafe in the film, the customers are both men and women. The jazz cafe seem to be a homosocial space of male owners, owners and musicians and customers, although they were few women customers. Do you have thoughts on how the music as performed and listened to in these two cafes play a role in the performance of gender? Wow, that's a interesting question. <laughs> I'll jump in on that. Uh, yeah. I was struck by that too, and I appreciate Mari's question a lot. I did notice that uh, the jazz cafe was mostly men and mostly older men. And maybe if there is time at the end, I'd like to ask Sandy as a representative of the jazz world, what she thought about the um, lack of the younger generation in that cafe. But turning to the Maid Cafe, uh, for any foreigner who goes to visit Japan, the topic of a Maid Cafe is a little bit weird. And I really picked up on a few of the statements in that film. First, the father saying, why on earth do you want to dress up to satisfy the you know, strange fantasies of guys you don't know. And that question is left totally unanswered. And then I think Ito is talking with her colleague from the cafe, who's the manga, aspiring manga artist. And they say, oh, one of the reasons I wanted to work here was in order to dress in a cute costume. And then literally 30 seconds later, without a sense of irony, the manga artist says something like, oh, those men who want to protect us from sexual harassment actually don't respect us, which is really interesting putting that side by side with wanting to dress up in cute, somewhat fetishized costumes. And I really have to say, I thought that was one of the strongest points in the film is that they left these sort of messy social issues just up in the air in a very human way without sort of delivering a moral at the end of the story. And I thought that was excellent. Yeah, I think that opens, um, that would open a, a door for an entire um, sociological discussion on Japanese culture and uh, women's issues in Japan, which is, you know, I, I'm, I'm also happy that that was brought up and, but yeah, that's, <laughs> we're musicians here. <laughs> Anyone else want to comment on, on that? Um, I mean, well, I, I've never, sorry. I've never lived in Japan, but so I don't know what your, you four would have to, you know, observe about things like that. I, yeah. I was kind of happy yeah. to see that, um, yeah, the, the, as far as Sugata Jami Sen is, is, you know, in, in regards to that, that there were female performers. Um, it's, it's kind of, I always kind of associate it as a very masculine playing style, you know, with the virtuosity and um, uh, you, you saw the way she sat with her legs spread wide open and everything. Uh, the men sit that way, of, the women are not encouraged to do that obviously, but um, the fact that, yeah, this is being passed on among the, the females, the women in the family. And even, um, uh, yeah, so I got to see uh, Takashi Chikuzan. Um, if nobody knows who that is, if you're into Tsugata Jamisen, you have to check out Takahashi Chikuzan. All these young kids out there want to know Tsugata Jamisen. But um, yeah, I got to see him perform. And uh, yeah, he was one of the last late blind uh, Tsugata Jamisen masters. And uh, it turns out that his successor is a female. So, um, and she, she took on the name Takahashi Chikuzan, the same name, but the second generation of it. So, um, I mean, I, yeah, I don't, know what, I, I don't know what that has to do with the maid cafes, but um, within the, the music tradition itself that is being carried on through uh, females, I think is, is yeah, not, noteworthy. Okay. Um... Got a couple more questions. Actually, just a statement from Amy on Facebook. I was a former Koto student of Darren Sensei, just wanted to say hi. So she just wanted to say hi, Darren. Uh, Keone from Facebook. Are you any of you interested in any non-Japanese instrument? Uh, 
loud nodding. Yes. Is there any other, I mean, in particular? Yeah. Will, Will works with Korean instruments, right? Right. Yes, definitely. Mm -hmm. um, uh, got invited to the National Gugak Center. I think maybe Chris went there as well. Um, uh, yeah, so got to study there and write, uh, had a, a modest premiere there. And um, that's, uh, I, I think here, um, it's it's primarily uh, Korean, Japanese, and, and Chinese, but there's um, as far as instruments go, and cultures go here that we typically write for. So yeah, um, uh, and usually combining those instruments with some other culture. So yeah, there's there's a lot of other interest here, at least on the composing side, um, for me, and um, I think that's probably true for most of uh, the music department here at UH, I would say, yeah. Um, yeah, Chris, Chris, you're working with um, non-Japanese instruments as well, is that right? Yeah, uh, it's an interesting quandary for a composer because it's very exciting to put sounds together which don't belong to one single unified uh, cultural tradition. Um, then there's also the practical logistical concern, which is if you write a piece for a Japanese instrument and a Western instrument, and then a Korean and a Chinese instrument, then how often in the future will you have those four people together in one place? So, you know, we're juggling these various logistics, but I think everybody who's composing music, be it in an art style, a pop style, and anything in between is just very excited by sound and the different traditions that are backing those sounds up. So combining things in that way is just, uh, it's food for the imagination. Mm -hmm. I know I was lucky enough to see the premieres of, of your compositions and uh, those of other others, including my Brazilian friend, Rafael, and uh, Darren was there. And were you in there too, Will? In the, um, that was on uh, YouTube, the UH Music Department's YouTube channel. Um, right. yeah. I don't think it's improper to promote that uh, concert that uh, the viewers who are curious about the kind of work that both of you do would be able to go and um, watch and listen to those, those compositions and see all the different instruments that are involved in, in that endeavor, which was very impressive and, and so many so many uh varieties of of types of music it was very 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 inter entertaining interesting <laughs> are there uh, any other think, questions uh, anderson yeah actually i have a question because like i wanted to just talk about more this is more kind of a um maybe cultural question especially in japan you know i think uh you know there's the sense of like how japan very much has a um is really, uh, you know, the culture, especially when it comes to audio, audiophilia, audiophiles, you know, and uh, just the just the appreciation of, of of music, and really adopting and adapting a lot of Western music, and you know, and, and this perseverance, and like you know, it's just in this very unique Japanese way. I mean, perfect example is um, the Jazz Cafe, the documentary, the the Jazz Jazz Kisa, right? I mean, these are very unique to Japan. They were really kind of sprung up in the 50s and 60s of like these, I mean, they're music, they're basically cafes where it's not really live performance, but you just go there to listen to recorded jazz music, right? And then that's like, um, and uh, which I find really, really interesting. And, you know, the fact that, you know, like, I mean, uh, you know, Sandy, I mean, just because of the diaspora, you know, when it comes to, you know, Japanese, Brazil, Japanese moving to Brazil and whatnot, and like, you know, kind of like the Bossa Nova movement and, and how it, you know, got it, uh, uh, you know, tr uh, was transported over to Japan and became its own uh, movement and, and jazz is a, as a, as a genre in Japan is very vibrant, you know, can you maybe talk about kind of like, kind of the, just the musicology, musicianship and the audio file type of um, culture that Japanese um, um, have, you know, really kind of uh, embraced. Uh, especially when it comes to a documentary like uh, you know that that uh, of you know of showcasing this very famous um, jazz cafe you know of um, and just uh, just music fans in general in Japan. Well, 
you know, I made me think of this little club that my brother used to be involved in. And I have one brother who is a professional saxophonist and the other brother is an audiophile. And he, he could actually be a jazz DJ. He has a, a collection of LPs and CDs that would make any jazz music show host drool. And I've seen them do that too. But he used to belong to this little group that would meet at uh, an audio store in Kaimuki back in, uh, I think it was the, the 80s and 90s. And all of these guys, they were all guys. And they would bring their LPs. And, you know, CDs weren't really invented then. But they would bring their LPs. And, you know, everybody would try to outdo each other with, with the, the more, the rarest version of this particular number or this session that was done or a live performance. And so, and they would all get together once a week and they'd play these LPs for each other. So when I saw the owner of the base, the Kisa Basi go and, and show the album to the, the female customer and she, her face just lit up. It was like, it was like a sommelier showing some kind of rare wine to a customer, right? And that she was so happy see that and so so this these guys would get together at this audio store this stereo store and they'd play it on the the state of the art equipment and talk about you know their armchair armchair listeners i don't think they were musicians at all they were all just audio files so yeah that i'm sure those kind of groups <laughs> exist all over the place but i think just because of um the the exaltation of, of being cool in Japan. And the guy was wearing a, a very brightly colored shirt. And I, I appreciated that because, you know, when you go to Japan, it's very, it's rather monochromatic the way the people dress. They wear a lot of blacks and grays and whites and not a whole lot of uh, splashy color. So um, it was, uh, they're all, they're all cool guys. So um, I mean, you, I think you look that's, at, uh, that's a very interesting group. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, you look at like, I mean, like you know, there's you know the the only Tower Records left in the world is in Tokyo, right? So that's like it's you know it's like you know it's like what does that tell tell you? I mean, like that you know, um, it's gone. You know, it's extinct now. It's completely out of business in the in the U.S. where it started. But Tower Records put off in like this is still existing at least you know as far as I know in. in um, in Tokyo. So, I mean, does anyone want to comment on kind of the audiophilia or, you know, kind of like embracing of uh, Western kind of music or other types of music in Japan? And um, just the kind of sense of collective, collecting it and, you know, like a, an appreciation in general? Well, having lived there and Anju can attest to this, um, in Japan, everybody's living in these really cramped spaces. And if you're if you're in a if you grow up in a typical household, um, and you know the latest Metallica album comes out and you want to crank it up, you cannot do that at home. So, um, like I was talking to Will about this, you know, if uh, you know, and and you know, it, no matter what kind of music you're into, like I bet. If I if I wanted to find a, a little cafe or bar that only plays Led Zeppelin, there probably is one somewhere in Japan. You might have to hop a train to go there, but um, yeah, and and yeah, it's it's so you can get together with your buddies and you know have a like a listening party, kind of like what Sandy was describing. Um, you can't do that at home in Japan. The the doors are so thin. Um, yeah, your parents would kill you. You know, neighbors would kick you out. <laughs> So um, I guess, you, you know, hopefully somebody in your circle of friends has enough money and they can, they have enough capital to open up a little cafe or hangout spot somewhere. And, and yeah, so that's why, yeah, I, I, I can understand what these guys are doing and how, how, how it can be really fun for them to just hang out and listen to their favorite music at a volume that um, they, can, they can't do it at home, so. I know part of the question that uh, you were reading earlier was uh, about the women that would frequent the the jazz cafes, and I noticed that they they made mention of uh, the 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 customers were widows, the women customers were widows, and so uh, I'm not sure, but maybe somebody can speak to the 
the the notion of of women going out by themselves to to listen to music or something i mean these are widows they they can do whatever they want and they don't have to, a, a husband to tell them no you can't go out so i don't know why that there wouldn't be younger people where they were saying that in the us uh, jazz performances are being increasingly uh, frequented by younger audiences and they like that but um I don't know. Uh, someone else could speak to that. Why, you know, younger women are not out there patronizing the the jazz <laughs> audio clubs in Japan. I, I have a couple of reactions, although I can't speak on behalf of widows, but it makes a lot of sense if you are a widow to head to a jazz cafe for the sheer concentration of guys of a certain generation. Um, I also think your point about like the, the concentration of cool in a jazz kisa and in terms of establishing a multi-generational connection, if you have an older generation that thinks they're the bomb, it's, it's like garlic to a vampire for the younger generation. Like you couldn't find a better way to make younger people stay away. But I think, yeah, on the whole, Darren's exactly right. In terms of audiophilia, Anderson, I don't know people specifically who are into the, the technical side of it, but I, I would definitely uh, reinforce the idea that you can find a lot of specialty clubs and bars that focus on a specific genre of music. So in that sense, there's a sense of community. And the one thing I guess I regret is um, I feel like based on the stories I've heard of say Tokyo or the greater metropolitan areas in the 60s and 70s that there were more places where people could go and strike up conversations with people that they don't know. Um, particularly, you know, around a shared interest or if it's just an sort of intellectual scene or if it's the equivalent of say Americans fascination with uh, micro breweries and the special hops you use for your beer. I think there are not a lot of places right now in Japan where you can go and uh, speak freely. And I wondered if um, anybody had thoughts on that in terms of, you know, being a stranger, particularly being a foreigner, but any background and being able to go into a place and meet people. And let me be more directed about that. Uh, <laughs> so for example, uh, Anju, if you think about playing uh, your music, like what are the venues where you can bring that music to people you think will like it? And do you, find places in Japan where people who don't know each other are comfortable just striking up new conversations? Do you mean where I perform in Japan? Like where I can perform for the people who don't know traditional music? Yes, and any kind of audience, people who like traditional music, but maybe also people who don't know it yet. Mm. Um, especially I want to share with the new generation, the next generation. So I want to perform a uh, younger generation. So Jido Senta, Darin san, nani Jido Senta? Jido Senta te nani? Senta te nani? Like a kodomo ga sobu yo na basho? Oh. Uh, Children Center? Like little, like yeah, yeah, yeah. Children's yeah. Center, yeah. Yeah. Like the Children's Discovery Center or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, like, yes, yes, yes. yes. Mm. Then we try to make them join us, participate, like some really easy percussion traditional things we brought mm -hmm. there and then tell them to join. If they join the music, Japanese traditional media things together, then I think I feel they will interested in or try to 
perform the mother's、uh, hometown music, the Mio music. So the mother, if they have interested in, then maybe the kids also easy to interested in.、Mm. Mm. Uh, of course, like I think we have to we have to wrap up this because we're over time. But of course, now we're having all these questions come in now. <laughs> but uh, uh, I'm gonna try to consolidate them. Basically, a lot of them.、Uh, so the last question, I mean, Anju, I think want to continue on. Like, what do you think of?、Um, Basically, do you think the movie like Ito、uh, can influence the young generation, especially when it comes to Minyo?、Um, uh, I guess the music, right?、Uh, what is your opinion on that about Ito? And do you think it can be influential? And again, like you said, you know, you wanna, you wanna, you wanna、um, spread kind of your music, your traditional music to、uh, younger generations. So, do you think a movie like Ito can do that? The ito, I think it's more easy to get the next generation if the our traditional instruments can collaborate with animation like Kimetsu no Yaiba, like Pokemon, like something like if this anime can collaborate, that would be better, I think, because the kids may not choose to see that movie. By themselves, so yeah.、Mm. So using kind of like popular, popular media like anime and whatnot, and then incorporating the, the the traditional music into soundtracks or maybe even into the storylines, right? Like,、uh, okay. And then、uh, so I mean, this is maybe so this is a final question that we have, Hans from Facebook.、Uh, is there still a lot of interest in traditional music in Japan? Or is it fighting for survival like much of classical music around the world? That's a loaded question for everyone. Anyone can can ask、uh, can answer. No,、oh, it's it's not in danger of dying out. Put it that way. Okay. There's yeah. Because there's always people interested in. Well, like for the koto,、um, what Anju just brought up, like in fact, just last night. I taught this piece、uh, from the Demon Slayer.、Uh, <laughs> there's a song <laughs> called "Good Enge." No, I'm serious. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, yeah. These, these popular melodies from anime or maybe video、right. games, Final Fantasy、yeah. theme songs are、um, being transcribed for traditional Japanese instruments. And yeah. Yeah, I gotta thank those people because、um, they do the work, and then my students find out about it, and I just have to go and find it and order it. And right. And, yeah. It keep it's it's kind of keeping things going that way. Yeah, and people don't people don't know what Demon Slayer is. It's just the biggest anime in the world right now. It's like it's、uh, huge. You, know, you can watch it at Katali theaters right now, and、uh, it's you know it's the biggest money making box office hit of all time in Japan. And there's a Netflix series and all that stuff. So I think that's a perfect perfect、uh, example of a vehicle that helps popularize kind of traditional music, right? So Anju San, have you played that song? Good Enge. With with your shami set and singing, no, no. <laughs> Shall we? <laughs> sure. <laughs> Hurry up, come back to Hawaii. <laughs> I can't go to Japan, so you, you can do、back. it remotely. Yeah. <laughs> right. Everybody's doing、we、that live, nowadays. We all live on Zoom anyway, so yeah.、Um, we all live in a simulation, but、uh, okay. So I mean, we have a, a lot of questions. I think、um, you know. Um, but I think we have to close up now, and I want to thank everyone for participating in this、um, special panel.、Um, thank you, Sandy, for for moderating um, um, and listen to Sandy on on HPR, the Brazilian experience.、Uh, thank you to Chris, William, Anju, and Darren for、uh, being part of this panel,、uh, and thank you to Josh.、Um, For for being our you know co presenter for this panel and、uh, working with us over the years to promote、um, not only、um, international cinema but also Japanese cinema here at, in Hawaii at the Hawaii International Film Festival, and then thank you to First Insurance, First Island Insurance of、um, of, of Hawaii for presenting being the presenting sponsor of JFS. So、um, there you know JFS is still running、uh, till Sunday, so you can grab your tickets or buy an all access pass and watch the eight. 
eight films that we have as part of JFest. Um, just go to hif.org for all the details and you can watch it all virtually in the comfort of your own home or on your phone or iPad or whatever, <laughs> or on your smart TV. Uh, and then, uh, you know, we this is just uh, the second of four um, showcases that we have um, throughout the summer. Next, next month is gonna be our Eat Drink film. It's our culinary cinema. Um, we're showing actually two, two films from Japan but that have culinary themes that are gonna be part of that um, Eat Drink film series. And then in July, we have the Viva La Cinema French Festival. So um, all that, all those details again are uh, at our website at hif.org or just follow us on social media at uh, HIF Hawaii. Um, okay, so without further ado, thank you again and uh, we'll see you soon and uh, mahalo. <laughs>